Thanks. So my talk, Writing Python Like It's Rust, is based on a blog post that I wrote a year ago. And it has generated a lot of discussions, maybe some controversies online. So I thought that it might be fun to turn it into a conference talk. My name is Jakub Beranek. Uh, I'm a computer science PhD student. Uh, got about two months left, so wish me luck. Uh, I teach at a university. I work at the, as a researcher at the Supercomputing Center. And I also like to contribute to open source. And I contribute mostly to the Rust project, where I'm a member of a few teams that work on the compiler performance and the Rust infrastructure. And I have been writing Python for more than 10 years. And uh, I always did it in a very dynamic style. So I used to write Python without type hints. Uh, I used dictionaries everywhere. My code was st stringly typed, not strongly typed. And I was using monkey, page, monkey patching and all these kinds of horrors. And uh, it was fun. But uh, I realized that uh, this code was causing me some very bad symptoms, especially for larger programs. And these symptoms were that it was very easy to cause bugs. Uh, I had to debug too many runtime failures and crashes, which was very annoying. Uh, it was hard for me to understand my code in retrospect. And it was also difficult to change and refactor it. And you might say, you know, this is a skill issue. If I was a better programmer, uh, I could do this. But uh, I didn't actually have a lot of confidence in my code. And kind of independently on that, I started using Rust. And it quickly became my favorite prog programming language. And my experience with Rust was quite different. So yeah, I mean, I first I had to compile my code. Then I had to wait a little bit longer for it to compile. Then I had to fight the compiler a little bit. But once I did all that, my code was usually just working. Like Without having to debug a lot of stuff, I had a lot of confidence that my, wor that my code would be working and doing what it should be doing. And I wanted to kind of port this great experience from Rust to other languages, uh, including Python. So this talk is essentially about uh, why do I write py Python in a way that is a little bit uh, similar as I do write Rust, and how do I do it? And essentially, I will be trying to port some notions of static typing and strong type systems to a language that is otherwise very dynamic. Uh, a small disclaimer, everything I show here is just like my opinions. I'm not trying to tell you how to write Python code. I will just be showing you how I write Python code. And maybe you can find some inspiration in that. Uh, also, this is one of those talks where if you blink, you'll miss something. So I apologize for that in advance. So step one is using type hints everywhere. I really use them pretty much everywhere. Uh, type hints are these small annotations that you can add to your Python programs to say that some value is of some specific type. Uh, they were added in Python, I think, 3.5, and they are being extended and improved in every new Python version. And where do I use them? Well, pretty much everywhere, but most importantly in interface boundaries, so in function signatures. I want to see what types are going into the function, and I want to see what type is going out of the function. I also use them a lot in data classes, in their fields, obviously. Uh, I will be talking about that more later. And sometimes I also do use them for variables, but, also, but only quite rarely. Because if there is some complicated expression, I can annotate it to help the type checker or the IDE. But if it's something very trivial, uh, I think that adding the a type hint in this case is just additional noise. So I don't really use them a lot for uh, variables. Uh, what you can actually use for the type hints? Well, you can annotate uh, primitive types like integers, booleans, or your custom classes like a person. You can annotate built-in data types like a list of integers, a dictionary that maps strings to integers. Or you can use some complicated things like this value is either an integer or a string, or this value is optional. It is either bool or the value none. And you can also do some more crazy things like you can say this value is the literal get or the literal post. and nothing else. So there is a lot of stuff that you can do with this uh, typing module. But I won't be actually talking about this module uh, a lot in, in detail. I will, I will be talking about the mindset and the motivation of why we should use type hints in the first place. So why type hints? Uh, I think the previous presentation had about one slide about this. I have about 70, so uh, it, will, it will be more, more uh, extended. Uh, for me, the most important reason is that types help me understand code. Right? So if I see a function like this, uh, just from the signature, I want to be able to find out what is it doing. But here, I have no idea. Like, what is items? Uh, what is an item, a singular? What is check? Is it a Boolean? Uh, what does the function return? So without type hints, I have no idea. But if we do add type hints, we can see that items is something that can be iterated, and it contains items. OK, so what is an item? Well, I can just click on it in my IDE, and I will immediately see the definition of what is the type. 
What is check? Well, it is not a Boolean, after all. In this case, it is a function that will be probably called for each item in this iterable. And I also see that this function is returning an item. Again, I can see what it is. And it is optional, so I need to handle the case where it is missing. So types provide documentation for me, and it is the kind of documentation that never gets out of sync, because it is code, after all. Uh, in addition to understanding, they also help me remember. So this is code from my bachelor thesis that I wrote about eight, eight years ago. And when I checked it last week, I had absolutely no idea what is going on. Like, I really, I didn't understand what is going on. Why? Because I didn't have any type hints. At the time, I think they didn't even exist. But uh, if I wrote this code now and I added the type hints, I would have at least some cursory glance about what is the code doing, even if it was after five years. Uh, types also help me write code faster, which might sound a little bit unintuitive, but uh, if you take uh, into account, for example, an IDE, if you don't have type hints, it can be quite difficult for the IDE to provide you with the correct auto-completion. But if you do annotate your code with type hints, you will essentially help your IDE help you write code faster. And this is also awesome not just for auto-completion, but also for navigation. Like when I encounter a new code or a new function or a function that I wrote a month ago, I want to be able to click on the types in the signature of the function and go to the definition of its types so that I can understand what is going on. And uh, types also help me detect when the code gets a little bit too complex. Like for example, if I was writing this function and I was trying to annotate it like this, I would probably realize that maybe this code isn't really the best code in the world and I should refactor my function, for example, into several other functions because when it's very hard to type, it can be a symptom of the code being too complex and too hard to understand. But on the other hand, we are still in Python, right? So type hints are still optional. So if I need to have a case where I really want to just stuff anything into a function, I just say that this is any, then this is perfectly fine. I mean, this is still Python. It's, it's not Rust. I can still say that I don't really care about types in some specific circumstances. So that's, that's also a nice thing. Uh, types are also, are also introspectable at runtime, and this can be used by uh, several libraries, or you can also use it in your own code. So for example, in the fast API library, when you annotate a parameter with a data type, not only you are documenting what is going on in your code, but the framework itself will use this information to parse this parameter from the URL in a specific way. And if it's not an integer, it will return an error to the HTTP client. Uh, notice that everything that I showed so far, all the advantages, I didn't even mention any form of type checking. I was only just saying the advantages from the form of documenting and understanding your code. But of course, if you want to move further, you should actually configure some type checker like PyWrite or MyPy. And if you were here at the previous presentation, you, we saw some uh, additional ones. And uh, these are essentially programs that can type check your whole code base without executing it and show you these nice errors that essentially tell you that you are using, doing something wrong in your code. And you should, of course, configure type checking in continuous integration. And once you do that, uh, you'll get a superpower because every type hint will become a mini test. And it is a great type of test because it doesn't need any maintenance or refactoring, unlike normal tests, because it is, it is always in sync. And it also provides you with very low latency feedback. Uh, what do I mean by that? So normally, when you have a Python code and you make a change to it, uh, it will look something like this. You will run your program or your tests, it will run up to the first error, then it will crash, and you will fix the error. What happens then? Well, you do this repeatedly until you fix all the errors, right? But a lot of those errors, at least from my experience, will be very silly, trivial type level errors. And this is a very slow feedback loop to fix all of them. But with a type checker, you can just run the type checker over your whole code base, get all the trivial type errors at once, fix all of them at once, and then only continue with the actual annoying, slow, run, fix, run, fix loop. And again, in my experience, the second approach tends to be quite faster than the first one. But again, we're in Python, so you can combine both. You can use whatever you want. If you know that you have type errors after some refactoring and you don't want to fix your code, you can just run it. It's, it's perfectly fine, it will work in Python. Uh, I did this sort of very, uh, I wouldn't even call it a benchmark, but just, uh, just to demonstrate something. I took the fast API uh, code base and I run its test suite. And it takes about 30 seconds on my notebook. 
and type checking this code base takes just a second. And I think this will be true for a very uh, large number of repositories that type checking is much faster than running your whole test suite. So it's much low, lower latency feedback. And uh, if you want to move your type checking to another level, you can actually also do type checking at the runtime. So there's, for example, this bare type library that you can use to annotate your code. And it will then type check your code as it is running. Uh, for example, if you have very dynamic code and like normal type checker aren't enough, you can also try to type check your code when it's running. Uh, so to kind of sum up this type hint discussion, I would say that using type hints improves my, the confidence I have in my code, and that is really a great feeling. And it also improves my confidence in other people's code. Because when I see that they are using type hints, and we have type checker in the CI, uh, I will have much more confidence about their code. I will need to study it in such a detail. And it also helps me when I refactor and change my code. Now, I put this fearless uh, word into quotes because in Rust, refactoring is really fearless. In Python, even with type hints, it's, it's not so perfect. But uh, still, I feel like type hints help me a lot when I need to change my Python code. Uh, I mentioned a lot of advantages. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to not mention some disadvantages of type hints. Uh, but to be honest, I really couldn't think of any. Like, to me personally, I, don't, I couldn't think of any disadvantage of this system. It just seems so obvious to me. But it wouldn't be fair to skip this, so I looked online. What do people say about type hints? What don't they like? So for some people, it's more characters to type. Uh, I agree, but also, like, whatever. <laughs> like, I, I, my productivity is not bottlenecked by the amount of characters I type, so I don't really care about this. Uh, the second uh, concern I saw is that using type hints is useless for throwaway code for a lot of Python scripts. So I also used to think this. But uh, then I was encountering the following situation very often. I got some idea. I implemented some prototype for this idea. I thought to myself, should I use type hints? No, this code will be long gone by next week. It's just a prototype. It doesn't need type hints. It's fine. And then, some time later, oh, this code that I thought would be just a prototype is actually running in production, and it is crashing, and I have no idea what is going on not only because of missing type hints, but also because I didn't use them. So if this sounds familiar to you, uh, I would really encourage you to try to use type hints as much as you can. For me personally, unless I'm literally in the interactive terminal with Python, I use them everywhere, even if, if it's just a five-line script. Uh, one concern that I also saw is that type hints in Python give you some sort of false sense of security. And uh, I think that this is a valid concern, but you really need to remember that type hints are not perfect. Like the type system of Python is not as, I would say, bulletproof as of some functional languages or Rust or some uh, other, other languages. So you still need to remember that even if you type hint all your code, it will not be bug free. But I mean, as long as you keep this in mind, I think it's still a good idea to use type hints. Uh, I think they really help me. Uh, to, to understand my code. And I also found this on Hacker News, and I cannot really say that I disagree, but a pig with a lipstick can still be better than just a pig, so I, I, would, just, I would just close it with that. Now, so that, that was step two of what I do, how to write Python in a way that resembles Rust a little bit more. The second step is actually very simple. Uh, but also very useful, and that is that I try to use data classes, again, as much as possible. Uh, when I encounter code that looks like this, uh, some function that returns a person, and uh, it returns some tuple, I have exactly zero idea how to work with this return type. Like, what is this string? Is it the first name, last name? I don't know. What is the integer? Is it age? Is it a so social security number? So this doesn't really tell me what is going on, and it doesn't help me. Like, the ID won't autocomplete and uh, tell me what, what is going on. Uh, then, sometimes, people try to improve. They use dictionaries. So now you have, like, a string for each field, so you know what is going on. But you need to take a look inside the function to actually understand uh, what are the names of those fields. And they can get out of sync very quickly. And again, you don't get any autocompletion. You don't get any auto-navigation in your IDE. So what's the solution? Just write a data class. Just say that this returns a specific type. Its name is person. 
Uh, this type is a data class of class person. It has some fields, they have some types. And even though this is a little bit more code to write, uh, it gives me a lot of advantages because, again, I have auto-completion with my IDE. I have navigation. If I rename some of those fields, not only the IDE can re rename them everywhere in my code, but if it forgets to do that or it doesn't work, it will immediately give me a type check error. So, uh, and also I have introduced a new name into the domain of my program, right? Like I'm returning a person. I'm not returning a dictionary of random strings or, or a tuple. So this was, this was a very easy step, just I tried to use data classes as much as possible. And uh, the first step is actually the most, I would say, interesting, but also the hardest one to do in Python properly, and that is embracing a concept that is called soundness in the, in the land of Rust. So what is this? Uh, when a code is sound, in, in my definition, like don't, don't take this uh, very, very precisely, uh, I claim that it is impossible or at least very difficult to misuse. So this might sound a bit weird, so let's unpack this. So what is misuse? Uh, this means that if you misuse code, you break its invariant. You do something that the original author of the code didn't anticipate. It is an unintended usage of this API. And typically, it will lead to runtime failures and bugs and all sorts of annoying stuff. What is impossible? Well, in Rust, it would mean that your code wouldn't compile. You would get a compile error if you try to misuse this code, which is sound. In Python, sadly, it's not, not that good, let's say. Uh, you, you will get a type check error. And also, the Python type system is not as advanced as in Rust. So there are some things that you just cannot do, how to express uh, the impossibility to misuse some APIs, but there is still some low-hanging fruit that you can try to do. So in the rest of the talk, I will be showing some code examples of how we can make Python code more sound. So let's imagine this uh, very simple function, uh, get car ID, it returns some car ID from a database. We have a similar function for returning a driver ID from a database. And then we have a third function that takes a car ID and a driver ID and returns information about some race. So how we can misuse this code? So imagine, for example, that we get some car ID from the database, then we get some driver ID from the database, and then we get some race. Right? Like this is a perfectly, seems like a perfectly normal usage of the API. What is wrong in this code? Okay, I don't have a lot of time, so I, but I think I, a lot of you saw it. These IDs are switched, right? Like I have, by mistake, I have passed the driver's ID as the car ID and vice versa. And this is the kind of bug that can be very annoying to debug because in tests, it will just work. Like you have car ID one, driver ID one, yay. And it can be very hard to spot because it, won't, it doesn't even need to cause any runtime failures, right? So what we can do about this? Well, we can just separate these types of the different IDs. So for example, using this typing new type, we can say uh, this is a new type called car ID, which is backed by an integer. And this is another type called driver ID, again, backed by, by an integer. And those two types now cannot be really combined together or used in the same places. Then we modify our code so that we return and uh, receive the correct types. And then if we would uh, run this function and we would swap the parameters, the type checker would immediately yell at us and tell us that we have done something wrong, right? So not, not only improves this, uh, the soundness of our code, I would also claim that in, it, it improves the uh, documentation of our code because now we are telling the user of this API, this first parameter is a car ID. It's not just any random integer. Okay, another example. Uh, let's imagine that you have this uh, client, it could be like a TCP IP client, and it has the following API, connect, send, some data, and close, right? And the problem with this kind of API that I see very often in Python is that it has some set of invariants, and these invariants are described only in documentation, right? So if you do, for example, send before connect, it's a bug, it's a runtime failure. Connect twice, it's a bug. Close and then send, it's a bug. Forgetting to call close might not even lead to a runtime failure, but it's probably, again, a bug, right? So what we can do about this? Well, we can change the API so that these kind of situations are not even possible. 
So we can create a connected client that only has one method, send, and then we can build a different API for connecting and closing the client. So for example, it could be done in many ways, but for example, we can use a context manager. We can create the client, return the client to the user of this API, and then whatever happens, always close the client. Right. And then when we use this API, we will just do with connect as client, send as many messages as we want, and it is now no longer possible to cause some of the previous issues. Like I cannot, I cannot send before connecting. It's just not possible with this API. I cannot, uh, for what I cannot do, I cannot connect twice. Again, it's just not possible with this API, and the client will be always closed. Right? Like there are still some bugs that I can do. I could store this client variable into another variable outside of the with block and then use it after it has, it has been closed. Uh, this would be prevented in Rust. Hard to do, how to, hard to prevent in Python, but I would claim that you need to really go out of your way to do this mistake. Whereas the previous mistakes could be just done, you know, as an honest mistake without you realizing that you are doing something wrong. And uh, this is a very, I would say, known idea uh, to make illegal states unrepresentable, right? Like if you have some states in your data structures that should, that, that is illegal, that shouldn't be possible to happen, you should make sure that you write your code in a way that it cannot even be represented. Another simple example, let's say that we are building a request, and this request needs some authentication. You can either use API tokens or username and passwords, and once you authenticate, you can build the request. Again, what can be the errors? You can call build without authenticating. You can call both API token and password, or you can call, for example, API token twice. All of these are runtime bugs, and this API allows them. So how to do it differently? For example, we can create separate types for request with tokens and request with passwords. And then we can modify the builder so that when you configure the token, it gives you a different type. When you configure the password, it gives you a different type. So now you can no longer call both of them. And you need to, uh, you need to actually call the build method on the created type. You cannot call it on the builder. So you can no longer build your request without authenticating. And now the final example, which is a bit more complex, so I hope I can make it in two minutes. Uh, last year, I was implementing uh, some ex AI exhibit in a museum, and people were kind of like waving their hands and selecting stuff on a virtual uh, display. So they had to put their hand over a virtual button, keep it there for three seconds, and this, this selected a button. And then when they put their hand away, it was unselected. So how to implement this? How to implement this? It isn't rocket science, right? So I just created a button state that had some attributes like hover is the hand on the button, selected is the button selected, and some timer, uh, like how long did the hand stay on the button. But the problem with this simple representation, again, is that it allows me uh, to represent invalid stuff, right? So if my hand is not on the button, but it is selected, that's invalid, but it can be represented. Or if the button is selected, but the timer is not yet at three seconds, you can represent it with this state, but it is not invalid. It is not valid. Sorry. So what I didn't. So and I had some issues with this. For example, when the hand left the button, I was resetting this one attribute, but I was always forgetting to reset the other ones, and it was just a complete mess. So I deleted that whole code, and I rewrote it as a state machine. So I created separated types only for the valid states in the program. When the button is inactive, there is no hand over it. You don't need any data. Where there is a hand over the button, you only need to remember how long it was there. And when the button becomes selected, again, you don't need any additional data. And then I can just create a button state type that is the union of those three types. Right? This concept is called sum types, or it, this is a sum type. And then uh, I just implemented a function that took the previous state and returned the new state. And I could explicitly enumer enumerate only all the cases that should happen in the code. Uh, I actually had this code on my slides, but I don't really have time to go it in detail. But the idea is that with this representation, I can explicitly enumerate everything that happens. So it is very explicit in the code, and I have confidence that I didn't forget anything. Right? If you want to examine it in detail, you can find it in the slides. And you can also find more examples of these soundness codes in my blog post. Uh, I will put it on Discord and on the conference system, so uh, don't worry if you don't uh, 
have the time to take the QR code. And just to wrap this up, uh, the idea of soundness is to make it hard to make mistakes in your API, to create a sort of a pit of success so that it is very easy to do the right thing. Uh, but we also shouldn't forget that it is not always possible to write code like this, especially in Python, and it is not always worth it. Like, creating this sound code can lead to an increase in complexity, so you should always consider the trade-off, whether it is worth it or not. And uh, to sum up, uh, to write code in Python like in Rust, you should use type hints, you should use data classes, you should make it hard to misuse code, and then you can perhaps profit. So thank you for your attention, and that was all. Uh, thank you, Jakob. Uh, we still have about two minutes for questions, so if there's one person who wants to run up here to the hallway to quickly ask a question at the speaker. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. Just a very simple question. For someone such as yourself, who's obviously adept with Rust, when would you go with the Rustified Python over just using Rust? Right, so I, I actually had this as my penultimate slide. Uh, so I actually, I use Rust for, I would say, almost anything, but at the same time, like Python is still a great language. Like it has so many awesome libraries. Uh, I do a lot, a lot of data science and uh, machine learning, and that's not really, it's not really possible to do everything in Rust these days. So when I just want to use Rust, oh, sorry, want to use Python or need to use Python, uh, I find that this approach really helps me to write better code. So that's it. But of course, if I'm writing something low level that needs to be performant or a distributed system, I will just use Rust. Oh, yes. Cool. Guilty. <laughs> I think we have one, time for one more question, if there's somebody with a quick <laughs> question to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, good question. Do you notice a performance enhancement using Team Heights or this approach uh, when you need to enhance the performance of your code, or it's just the same? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question. If do type hints Im have some help, effect on help performance? You improve, help you improve the performance combined with other practices, or it's the same? Uh, so currently, type hints are not used for, uh, for any performance-related things in CPython, as far as I'm aware. Uh, there were some proposals to maybe try to uh, prime the just-in-time interpreter by reading those types. But uh, yeah, I, I think some of the core developers said that it wouldn't be worth it anyway. So, yeah, I was thinking that it could be a nice idea to maybe try to use type hints to speed up Python, but I don't think it's really going to happen anytime soon. But there are things like Cython and other approaches. Okay, thank you. <laughs>